was not very smart of us, so, uh, uh, but we, we, we covered. Uh, as she is getting mic'd up, I am, um, so I, welcome to the uh, dis Distinguished uh, Speaker Lecture Series. Um, just want to remind you, the reception is in the lobby of Camper, Camper Hall afterwards, so from 5 to 6, so you're very welcome to join us there. And um, I'll then now introduce then uh, Professor Ralph Aldrich, who will introduce today's speaker. Can you check that mic? Yeah, I'll okay. okay, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Oran today. Dr. Oran is visiting with us from the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> where she's a senior scientist for reactive flow physics. She received her bachelor's in chemistry and physics from Bryn Mawr College, both her master's in physics and a PhD in engineering and applied science from Yale. And she also holds honorary doctorates from L'Ecole Centrale de Lyon and Leeds University. At NRL, she's responsible for carrying out theoretical and computational research on fluid and molecular properties of complex dynamic systems. Also, some of her research topics include chemically reactive flows, uh, <coughs> turbulence, numerical analysis, high-performance computing, and parallel architectures, shock and shock interactions, rarefied gases, and microfluidics. Um, some of uh, the applications of her work include combustion, propulsion, astrophysical explosions, and microsensor design. <clears throat> In addition to her position at NRL, she's also a, an adjunct professor of aerospace engineering at University of Michigan and also a visiting professor at Leeds University. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Please well, help me welcome Dr. Brennan. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. And there's no, there's no PA in the room. That's for TV. Oh. You're being filmed? <laughs> well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for waiting for me. I'm a few minutes late. I almost missed the talk. I was all prepared to give it to just a couple of you who were in a different building, and I thought this would be a really small and a very friendly audience. <laughs> but now I see I have more of a challenge. Pardon? Still friendly. Still friendly. Okay. So let's see what happens when I push the buttons here. Okay. We don't need to talk about this. That's, that's just a filler slide. I, what I've done today is uh, take a kind of a slice of some work that we've done over the last 10 or maybe even 12 years now. And it's been really very exciting work. And I sort of thought I'd give you a flavor for it. Uh, it's work that we've done in collaboration with a number of people at NRL uh, who have all different kinds of expertise. Uh, Vadim is an explosion chemist. David is, I don't know, he does everything. Craig is an astrophysicist. Uh, a lot of these people have expertise in turbulence, experimentalists, computationalists, theorists. And we've had a lot of advice from people who like to tell us what to do. <laughs> their names down here. And, and the work that I'll be talking about is a little sponsored by a number of different sponsors, uh, government sponsors over the years. And I just put them all down here because a little bit of everything. Now, I don't know how many of you have any background in combustion at all. Do you? Okay. Oh, okay, good. There's some people who don't. So just let me just give, give a few basic definitions so we can get through this. And at least we're talking about the same thing here. I'll be talking about just some background and terminology. I'll be talking about a laminar flame, a turbulent flame for detonation. A laminar flame, well, imagine a situation like this where you have a fuel. Okay, and a, a flame goes through it, a wave goes through it, which transforms the fuel into products. Okay, this is a very slow moving wave. It goes very much less than Mach, it goes Mach very much less than one. It's driven by energy release, expansion, thermal conduction, molecular diffusion, all sorts of diffusive properties. And it goes anywhere from a few centimeters a second to a hundredth of centimeters a second, but it's highly subsonic. Okay? The other 
they are, when the flames get very fast and they get mixed up with turbulence, you get a turbulent flame. This is a very undefined thing in general. It's an undefined entity. It's a very important part of a lot of stuff around us, including engines and things that, that drive our lives. Um, it's a situation where the Mach number is less than one, and it's represented by a wide range of conditions. People use the word flamelets for little flames in here, distributed flames, shocks. Uh, they call it a deflagration, which I looked up in Webster's, and it says vigorous burning with subsonic flame propagation. It's sort of an undefined thing, and a turbulent flame is to this day still a very undefined thing. Entity, and I'll talk more about that. Now, at the opposite extreme, where a reaction wave moves through these f the fuel and produces products, there's a detonation. Now, whereas this thing moves centimeters a second, this thing moves Mach two, three, five, very, very fast. It's a very powerful wave driven by the energy release. It involves compressible flows, shocks, all kinds of interacting shock structures. Now, to make, help make it move so fast, an awful lot more material is burning very quickly. So it's generally a thicker wave than a flammable flame. And what you have here is a very slow-moving flame controlled by all kinds of diffusive processes, molecular diffusion, thermal conduction, relatively slow things. You have a detonation which moves really fast, like that. So the issue that's, been, that, that's come up is essentially we understand laminar flames. We kind of understand this detonation where all these diffusive processes are not very important and it's, and it's driven at shock speeds. The turbulent flames are not well understood, but the transition of going from this very slow flame to this high speed detonation is something which has really not been understood very well at all. How does this happen? And I think that's probably less well understood than just the physics of a turbulent flame. Now, just to give you a feel for this, I hope the sound level is turned up on this so that you can hear it. Uh, the difference between the damage that can be caused by something which stays a turbulent flame or something that transitions to a detonation this were uh, some experiments that were done actually somewhere here in California <laughs> in the desert where they took a container like this and filled it with hydrogen oxygen and then ignited it. Now in this case the, the, the dilution was, was much more near stoichiometric, the optical, optimal mixture for explosion than here. And the difference, and what they did was measure the difference in the pressure that hit on the walls. So let me see if I can play these for you because the real key here is the difference in the sound that these make. What? The, the sound plug oh, there's a sound plug? Oh, somebody put it in. Okay, let's, so let's see if it'll work. If not, I'll hold my microphone. All right, so here's the flame. You could hear that, couldn't you? All right, now listen to what happens when it actually detonates. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm like a little kid. I just play these over and over. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, it gives you a feeling for what you're dealing with and the difference in the power of these two waves. And the material, many materials support both kinds of waves. Um, okay, so here's some numbers about them here, deflagrations, not so powerful can touch your window glass, detonations, they can really damage your structure, break your eardrums. Um, and what we know is that deflagrations are bad, detonations are pretty terrible. Okay, let's see if we can go on here. Uh, one of the motivations for some of the work I'm going to be showing you is a project that we had with a Japanese construction agency called Shimizu Corporation. It's, uh, they build large, uh, they build large things. And one of the things they were interested in building is hydrogen fuel stations for Tokyo. 
Now, in Tokyo, the fuel station, anything that's built has a, mini a small amount of land attached to it. You know, the footprint has to be very small. So they needed to do a design of the different buildings that, uh, for these hydrogen refueling stations that would be safe and small. And we helped them in that project. But one of the things we had to do for them was, was to evaluate when certain kinds of environments in which hydrogen could leak would be very, very dangerous and might detonate. Uh, there was a lot of very practical aspects of this, but part of it was some very basic calculations, which I want to show you, because they were, they were important not only for Shimizu, when we gave them all of the data, they were able to come up with design criteria, but they were also very important for fundamental combustion and fundamental turbulent reacting flows. And the canonical problem that people have used to look at the detonations of this work, you know, things are not working for me today. <laughs> Let's try this one. Okay. The canonical problems that people have used to, to look at the transition from a deflagration to a detonation or to look at how is, a, is something like this. There are these long tubes and they have a series of obstacles in them. Now, the, the reason this applies to back to the hydrogen fueling station is that you want to make sure that, the, that you have regions of the stations which are free of the obstacles, because you'll see that these obstacles are very, very, can cause a lot of very dangerous situations. So let's get back to the, sort of the basic combustion now. Let's look at this movie that I want to show you. Uh, imagine a tube that's two centimeters high and it goes on and on and on, and it's filled with a series of obstacles. If there's a little flame that's ignited often by a spark uh, or a match at the corner, this is a color bar here, so you're looking at temperature. And I'm going to show you a movie that will show you how starting with a small flame in a channel in this combustible mixture, which is here a hydrogen-oxygen mixture, uh, you can develop a turbulent flame, it'll produce shocks, and you'll see how the detonation actually forms. Uh, one difference in the movie I'm going to show you in the computation is that you won't be seeing it in the long row. I've taken the second part of, the, of this long tube and put it on the bottom. So you'll see the flow coming off this end and then down the bottom. It, it allows me to put more material on the screen. Okay? So let's show this. There's no... no no sound effects in this movie, so the only sound effects will be me. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see how this works. Load it up. Uh, I think view full screen. I think we're there. And the question is what you do with this. Well, I think we just put it up here for now. Not really sure. Okay, let's go. All right, so... A small flame is ignited in the corner of this two centimeter channel. You can see actually here the, let me just point, stop it and point this out. The, the, I'm going to talk about the numerical methods in a few minutes, but there's a lot of resolution in the flame front here, which actually goes across maybe 10, 15, 20 cells. Here, I'll talk more about that in a while. But what you've got is the flame ignited and then it expands into the material here and generates a flow ahead of it and then you see the flame interacting with the background flow. You're looking at temperature and this is a color bar here. It's a two color bar so it's a little two, two ranges, one for unburned material and one for the burned material. You see it's come over and through here now. Begin to see a little bit of the effects of the background vorticity that's formed around the obstacles. As the flame moves on, it becomes more and more, becomes unstable. It's interacting with the turbulence that's generated in the background flow. You can see sound pressure waves. Let's stop it a second. Pressure waves generated up ahead of the flame as it moves faster and faster. Here you're going to see one of the, one of the famous problems of compressible flow where a lot of pressure waves merge together to form a shock. Keep your eye up on the front. Uh, the other thing to look at are the shock reflections, which are occurring down here. You can see all these pressure waves forming up, various kinds of Mach waves forming down at the bottom, a very turbulent flame. It's 
getting, these waves are getting stronger and there it's reflected and that's transition to a detonation. Okay? This is a quasi detonation. It goes for a while and then it's destroyed as it, as it diffracts over an obstacle and then it goes and then it, it comes back to life again. Okay? So let's stop this here. What I'm going to do now now you think I've solved the whole problem of the transition to a detonation. I've hardly begun. <laughs> it's just a teaser. I would like to spend uh, a couple minutes right now just describing what happened in this movie because that's very important to the next part of this talk. Um, we saw this part of early flame propagation where this laminar flame was moving, moving through the material here. Uh, normally when people talk about laminar flames, you talk about all kinds of flame instabilities, uh, to thermodiffusive instabilities, very interesting combinations of chemical and fluid instabilities together. Uh, here, this, the, the effects of these don't last very long here because the expansion is so, f is so fast and so strong. They get, kind of get wiped out. Mostly what you see uh, is, is the, are the effects of the flame interacting with the background turbulence that's created as the expansion occurs. Okay. The obstacles in the flow here, obstacles in a flow, are, are, are a tremendous source of perturbations. Um, they, inter they distort the flame and the flame becomes more turbulent as a result of them. Um, what you wind up with is a very accelerated flame moving through the material. Okay. Now there was that fascinating part that I could watch over and over again where you see all the acoustic waves, you know, forming up into shocks. Um, and then the shock structures get stronger at the front, get stronger and stronger and eventually form a mock stem, another fundamental element of compressible compressible flows. Um, another thing that you'll see is the interactions of the shocks and the flame. And that's extremely important. I'm going to be talking a lot about that. Okay, we saw, we saw, the, uh, we saw the flames accelerating, the shocks forming, and then we saw the reflection at the wall here, which created what, I, what we call an ignition center or a little hot spot. And the conditions were right in that hot spot to ignite a detonation. And, this, and sometimes this wave that, de that became a detonation here, in this case due to reflections at the, uh, at the, at the wall here, sometimes it survived made, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't survive, you wind up with a flame and a shock. And when it does, you wind up with a detonation. And this, time, this case, because of the size of the channel, we wound up with a quasi-detonation, not a full one. Um, let's see what this one says. Yeah, you can see all the diff a little bit more of the diffraction processes here, how this goes up and over. And this happens over and over again here in this quasi-detonation. Now, if the channel's larger, and we did a lot of simulations for all different size channels and different size obstacles, if the channel is larger, you actually get a transition to a full detonation, which pretty much nothing can stop. And if we're lucky, there's a movie attached to this so you can see a piece from a larger calculation. Um, let's watch this one, because this one, the same physics, now you see it survives. It survived the diffraction process over the obstacle. These little lines here are transverse waves in the leading shock structure which are proof in the sense that this is, in fact, a detonation. And nothing is going to stop this beast except until it runs out of fuel. Okay. So, let's see if we can get out of this and go on to the next one. All right, so let me talk for a couple minutes about how we solve these equations. Uh, we solve the unsteady compressible Navier-Stokes equations in one, two, or three dimensions. We've done these same calculations with a number of different numerical methods just to make sure that what we were looking at was correct. 
because a lot of the things I showed you were new. They had not been seen, been, analyzed, been simulated before or analyzed. Uh, we've done it with low order good enough methods, high order FCT methods, PPM methods, so on and so forth. Everyone who comes has to do it by their own method. Essentially the same sets of problems. We've included models for chemical reactions, energy release, thermal collet conduction. In other words, the laminar flame is resolved. This is a computation of high speed flow in which we are taking very, very tiny time steps so we can resolve the behavior of the laminar flame too. And we felt that this was very important if we were going to see the deflagration to detonation pro transition process, that we had to do the full calculation. Um, so we can reproduce both flame properties and detonation properties. Now, here's, a, here's another thing. We resolve the flow in these calculations down to a microscale, not to the viscous microscale in the cold material, which we could never do, but to a, la uh, to a larger scale. Uh, what I showed you was not DNS, it was adaptive mesh refinement where there is a tremendous amount of resolution in those parts of the fluid flow that we felt required them. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. And several different methods were used for adaptive mesh refinement. And then the idea is we focused in on specific laboratory experiments. And some of these were actually designed for us to test the results of these models. Um, the experiments, we did some based on experiments by Garen Thomas at the University of Wales on hydrogen acceleration. And the more recent ones, which I'm really quite excited about, were the ones that were done at Lakeland Laboratories North, uh, in Pennsylvania on large methane systems. Just to show you about a little bit about adaptive mesh refinement. This is one method that we used. We used a couple, but this is the one we generally, generally use because it's the fastest. And in this one, we take a computational cell, and if it's in 2D, we'll divide it into four if we need more resolution. If it, and then we might take one of those and divide it into four more, and, and one of those and divide it four more in layers, in levels down. Um, and you can down in regions of shock fronts or regions of laminar flames or, any, or in boundary layers where we think there's going to be some action, we'll throw in a lot of resolution. And then if nothing happens, we'll take it out. So there's a whole numerical structure that's, that's required in order to do the simulation that I showed you. Um, so this, this the one I showed you was actually done on cell by cell refinement and derefinement. And it's dynamically controlled, it's controlled by the flow variables. We will throw resolution in depending. Uh, what, is this time really right? Oh dear. <laughs> Yes, that's frightening. Yeah, but I have a plane to make. <laughs> okay. You're scaring me. <laughs> and a long talk to give. Okay. Um, okay. So we. So it's okay. As far as we get, we get. Okay. No, it's not worry about it. Um, so we throw resolution in if we. On, if it looks like some radical is forming in the chemistry, and we need to. We want to see if it's going to ignite or if there's a um, we'll res resolve uh, velocity gradients if we think the boundary layers are going to be very important. Shock fronts, you usually have to throw some resolution. Um, those calculations went down about four or five levels of refinement. I have to say we've used this to a maximum of 30 levels of refinement in an astrophysical problem. And it can get very expensive to do that. But I do want to say that that is important for being, even being able to do a calculation like I showed you. Now, again, to be able to achieve that calculation, we have to do a lot of simplification of the physical model. And of course, we're solving the Navier-Stokes, the fully compressible, multidimensional Navier-Stokes equations by a number of different algorithms, but with a rather simplified chemical reaction model. And I think that the chemical reaction model is actually the key to the success here. Uh, it's extremely simple. Um, and uh, it's essentially a one-step model, but we have all the diffusion properties in that will give you the, 
uh, the properties of a flame. Let me give you the philosophy of that model. The philosophy of that model is very simple set of equations with a few parameters. Um, given a certain set of, a certain kind of material, say in this case it's a hydrogen gas, we, we have an idea of what the flame speeds are, we have an idea of what the detonation speeds are, there's a lot of parameters that we know. We want to be able to reproduce, we want to have a very simple model that can reproduce the right flame speed, the right detonation velocities, and some of the other right, right temperatures behind these. We want to get the macro chemical processes represented correctly. Okay. We're not trying to do the details of the chemical kinetics in these calculations yet. That's next year. <laughs> but we just want to get the overall input of energy into the system correct. Okay? So that given these input variables, background temperatures, can, uh, and uh, these chemical reaction parameters, diffusion parameters, we can produce something that looks physically correct. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about some of the physics here. What did we see? Well, we saw these detonations appearing from hot spots. Those little ignition centers that I showed you, they appear where there's unreacting material. Okay, you saw that didn't, the flame didn't turn into a detonation. What happened is that the, something happened in the background to create an ignition center which became the detonation. That was a change in paradigm from what a lot of people had said, and it caused me a great deal of stress. But it looks like that is, that is often the case. The flame itself created the conditions in the background material where this detonation could occur. So, okay, created by inhomogeneities. These hot spots are created by inhomogeneities in the background flow. Um, they may turn into a detonation, they may just decay into a shock and a flame, and uh, the background is very complex. Okay, that's a summary. And I talked to, and I showed you in that movie how the, how the, the hot spot formed behind uh, when this mock stem here hit the surface. And this was one that actually transitioned into a detonation. The shock reflected from that obstacle created the hot spot and ignition center and became what they call a spontaneous wave. Okay, so what do I have here? For different geometrical parameters, it, oh yes, as you change the geometry, you can have these hot spots form in a number of different ways in the calculation. It usually depends on the obstacle height or the size of the channel or something. But in all of these calculations that we saw, and we have done very many, in hydrogen, ethylene, acetylene, so forth. It's always happened somewhere in the flow. There's been a hot spot forming due to a confluence of waves, some turbulent phenomena, and that hot spot had the right conditions to undergo a transition to a detonation. Now, the physics of these hot spots, which create what they call these, these gradients of reactivity, the, the first person to actually discuss these was Zeldovich in a paper in about 1969, 1971, I believe. And the physics of this, well, my time, time is right, but I want to tell you how this happens because it's really physically very interesting. Um, how this, okay, now suppose you had a homogeneous material, hydrogen, oxygen, okay? And it's, this, is a, this is a material that would support flame, support the detonation, it's highly dangerous. Suddenly raise the temperature to, to ignition temperature. To the whole material you raise simultaneously. Okay, and it would just all go off at once. Well, think of that as a wave that goes at an infinite velocity from one side of the channel to another. Okay. Now, put a gradient of reactivity in that material. There's going to be some place that's going to ignite first and another place that's going to ignite second. So you're going to get what looks like a phase wave. And depending on the gradient, it will look like you have a wave running from one end to, of the channel to another, but it could be at speeds, the speed of that, it's a phase wave. It's like shining a laser at the moon. 
it can look like it's, that each spot that ignites with each fluid element is in some ways independent. And it can go apparently at the speed of light or higher, you know. But it's not a real wave. But eventually, when these spontaneous waves form, they begin to slow down and interactions occur. And it's a result of these interactions where a detonation wave can form. There's been a lot of very interesting work on this. It's a whole field in itself that people have looked at, mostly theoretical, uh, to study the spontaneous waves and how they can lead to ignition, detonation ignition. They'll lead to... Uh, They'll lead to a detonation if the, uh, if the gradient is, is correct. They'll lead to a separated shock and a flame if it isn't. Um, it's believed that this situation here, where you have a shock and a flame which don't make it to a detonation, is what causes knock in your engine. engines. OK, so what have, what have we learned here? Well, we think we've learned that the turbulent flame creates the environment and the unreacted background gases in which the detonation may occur. So the flame itself has not become a detonation, but it creates the conditions that do. Uh, there were a lot of controversial elements in what I showed you. And that's a whole talk in itself and why it was a controversy. But one of the pro things was that the results didn't look all that bad. And Shimizu uh, and NEDO, N-E-D-O, it's a Japanese research organization, sponsored some experiments that were done to test the predictions of the model that we did. Um, these were done by, uh, by Andrei Teotorczyk at Warsaw Institute of Technology. Here are some of them, where he uh, essentially set up, um, set up a series of calculations in hydrogen oxygen gas and measured the distance to the detonation transition that they saw. So we've plotted here the experiments. Now remember here we had done the calculations before the experiments. So you can't blame us if there's agreement. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jokes aside, um, the, uh, the CFD, our results are these little red ones, and their experiments were these blue ones. And for the sponsor, this was considered very good result. I mean, they were happy with what we gave them. They said, okay, we can trust this, this model, these experiments, and we can take the data, put it all together. But there's something, there's other things that happened that were a little less settling. You know, it's very nice when your calculations agree with experiments, but you have to ask sometimes why, especially if you're not so sure about the calculations. There's an awful lot of approximations that went into what I showed you. Here's, a, here's one that was really disturbing. We did a series of 3D calculations and a series of 2D calculations. And we, and we plotted the, the time to the transition to detonation. Okay? We couldn't afford at the time to do one that was eight centimeters high of this. Now we probably could. We managed to do one, two, and four centimeters. And we were getting transition to detonation in 2D and 3D at approximately the same time. That maybe helped us agree with experiments, but it doesn't sound very reassuring to anybody. Okay, especially when you look at the complexity of that turbulent flow that I showed you. What could be going on here? Another application. <laughs> I don't know why. I think I've jumped a bit ahead now. Um, based on the agreement and not the understanding of why it agreed, we began to do some work with uh, NIOSH to look at coal mines. Coal mines are perfect geometry for us. Uh, they have these long channels with obstacles, exactly like what we were computing, only methane instead of hydrogen. Okay. Um, the scales are bigger, but so are the channels. Right? And we also we started to work with them to try to... Uh, here, here's the, the, the uh, mine I should talk to you about at Lakeland Laboratories. Uh, the, uh, experimental mine. It has these long channels. That's one region. Another region is uh, are a, a bunch of pillars. Okay? And what they wanted to do there was to fill this thing with 
with uh, methane and ignite it. <laughs> they still want to do this. I mean, can you imagine that? This, bet, this is almost as good as a supernova <laughs> if you could fill this channel. And that's what they're hoping to do next year. So we started to work with them, but we did manage to convince them that um, the, ch the uh, problem was too big to fill the channel. We shouldn't jump from something laboratory size, which is this size for methane, to something that's 80 meters across and a kilometer long. So they built this apparatus here, which is a, a meter in diameter and about 70 or 80 meters long. And these are the guys I work with, our the computational group, <laughs> um, helping to put together this test facility, which is out near the, near the mine, outside the mine in the quarry. And we're getting results from that now. So we did the same thing for methane air and other methane materials that we did for hydrogen, a, this crude concept of a chemical model where you sort of try to release the energy in the right way, get the right generic properties. And uh, we had these sort of target values for the flame speed, the detonation speed, and, and we're able, in the case of stoichiometric methane, to get a model that reproduced the, the results fairly well. And, uh, did the same series of calculations before they did the experiments. Um, and this, this time we had data from uh, experiments that were done by, by Kuznetsov for channels that were seven, actually uh, 17 and 52 centimeters in diameter. And someone else had done one for a seven centimeter channel for methane. So we had some, some data. We could check the models to see if we got the one dimensional flame properties right, the one-dimensional detonation properties right, and then we could check to see if we were generally getting the right flame accelerations. This is an absolutely gorgeous movie, and even though I'm worried about time, I think I want to show it to you anyway, but maybe I can accelerate it a little bit and get to the end. Um, Let's see, it's temperature, pressure, and velocity. This is, I think, the 17 centimeter channel, but it may be the 52 centimeter channel. I'm going to accelerate it way up and let the thing go. Methane is a lot, had a lot more structure. You look at the temperature. It became very turbulent. Uh, here, this gives you the scale here. This is 20 centimeters. So you can imagine the the time and resolution that was required for this calculation changed the, changed the scale. But look at the turbulence and look at the shocks. Look at the shock flame interactions. And look at the shocks building up here from the acoustic waves, which are generated by the flame, the mock stems that are formed. And eventually, because of these obstacles, you get the same the same effect. I think this one has an ignition. Let's see if I can accelerate to it. Oh, did I just miss it? Let me go back. I hate cutting this movie short. This is such a nice one. And they were actually able to read pressures off of this to use for some of the design of seals in mines. There we go. It should, it should go pretty soon. One didn't work. There we go. Did that detonate? Yeah, that detonated. Okay, now this is big enough to support a detonation, this particular size system. All right, let's get out of here now. I'll, I might come back to that. Um, so you compare it to experiments. Here we go. These are for, I don't know, one of the systems. There's several that we did. This one, now there's several aspects of this. One is flame acceleration and the other is detonation ignition. Flame acceleration we generally, generally tend to get fairly well in this model. Detonation is, is problematic, but then again it is in the experiments too. It seems to be very sensitive. Uh, and that's part of the stochasticity issue, which I probably won't have time to talk very much about today. Um, but generally the conclusion was that these results were not all that bad and that maybe we could simulate the large systems. But anyway, we've done a lot of these calculations. We did them, if I summarize, try to summarize them a little bit, we've looked at a number of different materials, ethylene, acetylene in the very beginning, thermonuclear carbon oxygen materials like in white dwarf stars, 
hydrogen, now all different kinds of methane stoichiometries. Looked at the, some of these calculations in many dimensions, a number of different geometrical configurations, a number of different ignition mechanisms. This is a 10-year project. I put here a summary of the comparison to the experiments. And um, again, it, over and over again, it just doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look perfect, but it certainly is good enough to get someone interested, in, someone to say, well, okay, we can kind of trust the data. Now, the question of all along here that was, became really niggling to me was why is this agreeing? A crude chemical model, okay? A lot of the turbulence is not resolved. 2D versus 3D. There was just too many things that were disturbing. So I came up with, with this question, how can this happen in, in this turbulent system? And it was, wait a minute, I went the wrong way in the talk. That's not good. Okay, I came up with two, two possible things that we had to look at to understand what was going on. One thing is that maybe the chemical model is good enough. Uh, what the model does is that it carefully controls how the energy is put into the flow. It's not doing anything fancy like predicting pollutants, but it may be the timing is right by controlling, by, by like, you know, when you fix conservation in a system, you, you it, computationally, it's a big win. Here we're fixing certain things that we, that, we, that we have adjusted parameters so that always gives us the right laminar flame speed, always gives us the right detonation speed. We've got the limits of the energy input rates correct. So maybe this is good enough. Um, but it's, it can't be enough because that really can explain 2D versus 3D in any sense. And that was a very disturbing issue. So then we really had to face, face it and look at the nature of the turbulence that we're seeing. The turbulence in here is not the regular kind of turbulence that you know about, you know, Kolmogorov cascade, but it's controlled completely by shock interactions. So it's a different kind of turbulence. It shocks and flames, shocks and shocks, shock traveling in homogeneous material. And this whole idea, we thought, required some further investigation. Uh, now, this is not an unusual or a kind of turbulence. It's unusual from the textbooks, which talk about driven at the large scale and how all the, the, the energy cascades down. This is driven at all scales, simultaneously. This is what we do see in all explosions, maybe in a lot of engines. Anything with, with a high-speed reactive flow is probably going to have all these different kinds of effects in it. And it won't behave like this normal kind of turbulence that we read about in the textbooks. All right, so let's think about it for a minute. When you looked at those pictures, you saw shock flame interactions. A shock flame interaction is a, is a type of a rickmeyer meshkov interaction. It's when a shock hits a contact surface. And there's some very interesting properties of the rickmeyer meshkov turbulent instability. And uh, one is that the growth rates in two and three dimensions of this instability are very similar. And there's other kinds of interesting effects is that um, uh, in the, in the, if you have turbulence that's driven by rickmeyer, by shock flame or rickmeyer meshkov instabilities. Um, so the, the growth rates are similar, the amplitudes, both qualitatively and quantitatively, in the linear and, and well into the nonlinear regime of the instability. And there's been some interesting theory and simulations on this. So that if we thought that, well, maybe this is a hint as to what's happening, you know, driven by rickmeyer meshkov instabilities. Uh, it's not the usual thing stirred at the large scale. Maybe there's some 2D properties that have been imposed on the system by the nature of the turbulence in the system. Now this is getting, is kind of difficult uh, when, you when you first begin to think about it. Here's one, an extraction from, from that last movie. You're seeing here a sh the shock hitting in the flame, hitting the flame, 
and then the development of these, of these instabilities here at the surface. And these are very classical type pictures of, uh, of what happened, of uh, Rick Barmeshkov instability. And what happens here is increases the surface area of the flame, it burns faster, and, um, and here the shock is actually moving through the flame here. Okay, so we thought, well, that's, that's really very interesting. And then someone came to me and said, you know, this movie that you have, um, it looks an awful like the, a lot like uh, the Orion Nebula. <laughs> and he said, no, no, that's not what I meant. He said, but, but look at all the shocks here uh, that are in the Orion Nebula. Well, there are shocks in here and contact surfaces and ionization fonts, which are different. And I couldn't, I couldn't get anyone to tell me which was a shock and which was an ionization font. But when I looked at this picture, and then I looked at some of the things we had, I began to think, see something else, too. We focused on this Rick Meshkov instability because looking at the interaction of the shock and the flame was so beautiful. We couldn't look at anything else. But what was happening is this whole system was filled with shocks, shock interacting with shocks, shock interacting with, with uh, gradients, uh, all kinds of things that would generate vorticity. And with all of this happening, this is, uh, we, we took a look at some work that had been done on, on shock on shock driven turbulence. And there's interesting effect, interesting things where you can get the typical Kolmogorov K to the minus five thirds spectrum but it's driven by totally different kinds of, uh, of turbulence. And an interesting property, uh, which is very similar to 2D turbulence, is that intermittency is suppressed. That's kind of a technical term. But I wanted to show you, just show you this picture again. Look, it's full of shocks. And it not only has this beautiful shock flame interaction, which is really beautiful, but this whole system is filled with shocks and shocked inter interactions. The turbulence is very, very non-equilibrium and very non-isotropic. So we began to say we really have to look at this kind of turbulence. And the time is a little bit running out, so I'm just going to, to skip a few things and try to get to the point here. Began then to look at different kinds of turbulence. And for example, when you have this Rick Meyer Meshkov picture, or the shock driven picture, you're, you're generating vorticity at all scales simultaneously in the system. Not just at the large, uh, you're driving at the large scale and having it come down, but you're populating the small scales as fast as you're, as you're populating the large ones. You don't know exactly the level at which you're populating, but you can imagine that you know, it's, uh, it's, it's much faster to populate scales that way, to create turbulence at all scales, than it is to have just wait for a cascade to happen. Much, much faster. And that's what happens. Here's an example of a calculation where we gave, gave it this energy. It's a 3D turbulence calculation. We give it this energy injection rate for a hypothetical rickmeyer meshkov or shock-driven turbulence, and you get this kind of a, of a turbulence spectrum, and otherwise a Kolmogorov one would look something like that. So the whole way energy goes in is different. Um, and the whole way it interacts with the flame zone is different. And this began this long, od this odyssey that we've had to try to understand the differences in the turbulence. And one thing we found is that we looked at this broadband turbulence, which we learned was the term the community often used for it, that vort vorticity is, very, uh, is really suppressed. And this looks, has a, a 2D look about it. It has a, pro it has a property of a 2D turbulence. Well, you know, this still is not explaining why we get agreement. It's just put us into a whole new direction to try to understand this turbulence. Because the implications of it is that a lot of the turbulence modeling that people are using, doing now for very high speed flows is probably missing some really important physics. Uh, how important, I'm not sure. Well, we've gone on now to do a lot of DNS simulations of flames in, in, um, 
Kolmogorov and non-Kolmogorov turbulence. This is a pretty one. Um, and in the process of doing this, I have to say that we've learned that we, don't, we have no idea what's happening. The first thing we've found is that all of the, the combustion diagrams that people have spent their whole lives postulating, including certain friends of ours, are wrong. <laughs> They're wrong. They're just wrong. <laughs> but we have to prove it, and now that's a major thing we're going to have to do. Um, even if, you start, if you're driving Kolmogorov turbulence on a large scale and you're driving it hard enough, your turbulence is intense enough, this flame will get so tangled and it will get so energetic that it will just detonate all by itself without even having to, to interact with a wall or anything, which changes a lot of people's pictures of the, of the way these systems behave, I think. I'm not going to show you the Rickmeyer one. We've looked at a lot of different ranges of turbulence now. I don't know what I can say here, except that the only thing that we've found so far that will help us explain those original calculations is that the turbulence that's driven by this, this broadband turbulence is has a certain features about it that are 2D-ish, okay? That's about all I can say there. So I was going to say a little bit about stochasticity, and I think I'll just say that very quickly because I don't want to keep you much longer. We're already over in time. Turbulence is stochastic. What does stochastic mean? means that, well, I, ha I looked up this definition from the dictionary, the ability of a process to deviate randomly from its path. Some systems, and particularly turbulent systems, small changes in the initial conditions or something that happened give you a different end result. Turbulence is stochastic. The generation of these little hot spots in, a, in, in these processes is stochastic. You have here an interaction of multiple stochastic processes. What can you say? <laughs> Do we have any hope, I guess? We've done a number of tests where we've just taken some tiny, tiny back changes in the background conditions, change the temperature randomly in the range plus or minus 0.01 degrees to see if we can still reproduce the same answer in, the, in a deterministic computation. And we found certain regimes and certain types of processes, like the, the calculations I showed you are fairly robust to those small changes. There are changes in timing, but not changes in the events. Other problems we found, small changes totally change the physics. And this is this whole issue of stochasticity. We say that is an area of research, and we're not quite sure how to handle it. So what is my conclusion? There is some sensitivity to the time of DDT, but not to whether it happens in the calculations I showed you. So I guess in summary, what, what have I said? Uh, I guess I'm baffled by a lot of the things I showed you. We talked, I talked about those hot spots, which are completely fascinating. Small, dynamic, they control the transition in this flow. And we probably understand it pretty well. Turbulence, I still don't know why the predictions are reasonable. I mean, I guess I can hand wave it, but I can't prove it. Uh, we're looking at non-equilibrium, non-Kolmogorov turbulence. We think it's very important not only for these kinds of explosion processes that we're looking at, but for all various models people are using in engines. And the stochasticity issue is, <laughs> the only thing I can say is, how can the predictions be so unreliable? <laughs> and I guess that's about it. Thank you very much. You mentioned in the beginning that you tested many codes, mm -hmm. including first order Godunov method. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, I mean, you must have billions of points. Yes. Do you think that first order Godunov is good enough? Yes. I mean, first order Godunov for turbulence and shock wave interaction? The, the, I can, I'll show you the algorithm. It is working. It does. The only difference that we found, it's, it is a conservative method. Um, mm 
the large scale quantities didn't if change people very do much. Respect what for changed? For turbulence, and now we are sorting turbulence with shocks with first order of steam. That's right. It's pretty much first order. Oh, maybe it's second order. I didn't. No, I didn't say first order. I said second order. No, no. In the in the in the slide. That's a typo. That's a second order. <laughs> we would never use a first order group. No, <laughs> no, it's a second order. I'm sorry. Excuse me. That, thank you. That is a typo. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, not first order. No. <laughs> You're the first one who's caught that. <laughs> No. It wasn't surprising you at all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's a second order method. We've gone from, and that it is perfectly fine for what we're doing. We don't. How many points you use in two dimensions? Um, it depends on the calculation, to be honest. Um, the small one that, those original hydrogen ones, well, it changes in time. The now to use. I have one, I do have one slide which shows what, that it goes from 50,000 to hundred, hundreds of thousands, or it can go from hundreds of thousands to a billion, depending. When we do this large one meter channel, which is 70 meters long, we're, we're using billions of cells to do it. Hydrogen requires huge, res I mean, methane requires huge resolution because the flame is so thin. So those, those calculations get very, very expensive. Then it depends on how much resolution we're going to give the background uh, turbulence versus the, the flame front itself and the region around the flame. You know, the reason I ask this question yeah. is that you took the numerics for granted and oh, then no. all this agreement with experiment and all these questions right. and we have to make sure that the numerics are acceptable. In the well, that's experience. why we did three methods. We're not stupid. <laughs> no. The first, the results are controversial. So you have to do it with more than one method. What is the same is the physical model. The same chemical model, same initial conditions. But, you, but there's so many issues in here. What we find is we see the shocks more clearly. I can show you a, the result of one of these calculations with a high order method, and a shock further back looks a lot better. But we did find some, in certain calculations there was sensitivity to how well we were resolving the background turbulence, not just the stuff around the flame. And um, there's some, so that there's some minimum you have to get right, and then you're then you're okay. You get convergence. Yeah. I was wondering, yeah. three-dimensional obstacles? Yeah. And that result in, result in We couldn't afford to do 3D for the methane. We did 3D for hydrogen. We did a bunch, a number of different tests for 3D for hydrogen um, calculations, because they were smaller channels. But there was no... The obstacles were 2D. Yeah. We tried different shapes obstacles. Well, that depends for different design issues. Only when we when we did the the 3D calculations, we still had the 2D obstacles because that was what the experiments were. So we just kept them that way. I'm just wondering if there are no. differences between the 2D 3D calculations if your obstacles were 3D instead of 2D. You mean if they actually had 3D? Oh, there would be some changes. I, I think there would be. Yeah, we're seeing it now with some of the uh, some of the new algorithms where we ha we're putting different shapes in. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Okay.